Tyrell Steins, I'm a critical care paramedic with Lifestar, and we're going to talk about plasma protein binding. They are proteins that are in the plasma. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. <laughs> no, but seriously, they actually are in the plasma. Think of them as transportation units. Their main job is transportation. Plasma proteins are proteins that grab a hold of medications that are going to be wasted, basically. All medications inside the body are actually technically a poison. Anytime that you administer something to a patient, it's naturally not supposed to be there. It is a drug. It's a poison to the body. The body recognizes it as foreign. And the poisons have side effects, and well, sometimes we very much like the side effects of the poisons we give to people, such as the side effect of fentanyl binding to the opioid receptor site, specifically the mu opioid receptor site, and taking away the pain. Plasma proteins are in the plasma and pick up medications that are going to be disposed of. While attached to the protein, the medication cannot be used by a receptor site. Therefore, it does not affect the body when it is joined with the protein. So bound up medication that's bound to the proteins is inert. It can't be active. It does not work on a receptor site at all. Pharmacokinetics is the time course or life of a medication from start to end in a nutshell. Pharmacodynamics is the reaction of the medication to the body, what it actually affects, how does it actually work in the body. You have first pass metabolism where the medication goes through the liver, such as PO medication. We're not gonna be looking at that today. We will be focusing on second pass metabolism, and so we'll be focusing on the medications that are that we administer IV that are going into systemic circulation. And so that second pass metabolism, it's ready there, it's bypassing the liver, it doesn't have to be processed, it is the bioavailability of it is a hundred percent because we administered it IV and it is right there. But think of, think of the plasma proteins as transportation units, kind of like UPS. Options for blood proteins, they come in different families. We have the albumins, which we'll discuss in more detail. We have the globulins, which globulins are, they participate in the immune system. We have the fibrinogens, which are for blood coagulation. We have the regulatory proteins that are for gene expression with the clotting factors. Clotting factor blood proteins have to do with causing fibrinogen going into fibrin. Down below we can see that there are a lot of different types of proteins. Albumins, alpha-1 acid glycoproteins, alpha-1 antitrypsin, etc., etc. There are tons of different blood proteins out there. Two main types. Albumin is the first main type. When somebody says albumin, the first thing that I think of is osmotic pressure. I think of albumin playing a huge role in maintaining osmotic pressure. It actually makes up for most of your osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure, as you know, is what keeps your fluid where it is supposed to be so that you do not have edema, so that you do not have ascites. The second thing I think of is alcoholics and liver cirrhosis, the lack of albumin in the blood. The other major role besides osmotic pressure for albumin is transportation of insoluble molecules, which is most of what we're talking about today. It is the transportation of medications. Alpha-1 acid glycoproteins are the other major player for administering medications and who is going to be transporting those medications. Once again, medication that is not protein bound is not available to activate. So you cannot activate a receptor site if you're all bound to protein. That is why the pharmacist scientists who 
thoroughly evaluate and do rigorous testing of these things. Figure out the exact amount of medication necessary because if you give too little, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to get bound to the protein and be inert. Here we look down the list of common medications that we give and what protein that they are bound to and then what is the affinity. And so if we look at most of the benzodiazepines are going to be bound to albumin and they are pretty high, have pretty high affinity. Uh, Versed is going to want to be bound to that protein and will kick off other things such as fentanyl. Fentanyl, you can see, is 78% albumin, 12% alpha-1 acid glycoprotein bound. And 80-85% to has less affinity than Versed. That's why the combination of those two are, is so drastically strong. It potentiates. Here are some, some of the common things that we use. Running down, we'll just briefly glance at this. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to say, uh, it is so utterly complex in researching and studying about this topic, I cannot stress it enough, the complexity of the matter, and a lot of these things you can't find or you can only partially find an answer to because we don't know the answers yet. Looking at nicardipine, what does it bind to? Using the isotope techniques, equilibrium dialysis, and incubation experiments, we characterize the binding of nicardipine to isolated plasma proteins, human serum, blood cells, and platelets. Nicardipine was mainly bound to lipoproteins, oro, so mucoid, albumin, and erythrocytes in human blood. Nicardipine, bindolol, and imaprene were found to share the same site on orosome mucoid. The determinants of nicardipine binding to the lipoproteins were triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol esters. Nicardipine partitioned into erythrocytes showing a constant ratio of distribution between inter and extracellular compartments. Nicardipine partitioned less to erythrocytes when increasing amounts of binding plasma proteins were present in the extracellular compartment. In human blood, 12 to 18% of the total nicardipine was present in erythrocytes. The overall binding of nicardipine in serum varied from 98 to 99.5%. And correlated with serum oroso, oro, and correlated with serum oroso mucoid and serum lipid concentrations. It is so complicated, and in trying to research this, I've gone to use my background in chemistry quite a bit, trying to figure out items and deciphering them. Just running down down a list, I put together a large large list when looking at this with various different things. So looking at a case review, this is a call that I went on. And Lifestar 3052 called for an interfacility transport from Losada Crossings Assist Living Facility to St. Joe's West Bend ER for a patient with back pain. Lifestar 3052 responds code 2 without incident or delay. On arrival, the facility staff report that the patient had fallen yesterday. It was unwitnessed. He had no loss of consciousness. He had gotten up and tipped over onto the arm of the chair next to him. He was sore yesterday. He just had lunch and the pain has just gotten worse and worse. It hurts for him to breathe. The patient denies that he fell today. On arrival, the patient, you must find a 78 year old male, ANO times 4, GCS of 15, laying back in the recliner. Skin pink, warm, dry, normal, capillary for less than 2 seconds, and normal work of breathing. Patient chief complaint of severe right-sided lateral lower chest wall pain, right flank pain, right-sided lumbar and sacral pain. Patient has chronic lower lumbar and sacral pain from previous spine injury, which he has a fentanyl patches, which he has, has been on fentanyl patches for years. The patient is 10 out of 10 pain and cries and screams occasionally. Severe pain, sharp and intense. The pain is constant, but also comes in spasms and is unable to bear it when he attempts to move. Vitals are as recorded. Patient reports that he was attempting to get up with his walker out of his chair, then lost balance and fell. He landed on his other chair on the arm on his right side of his ribs. Patient denies any loss of consciousness, patient denies any chest pain, patient denies any nausea, patient has good CMS times four, no head pain, no neck pain, no upper back pain, 20 gauge is established, right forearm sailing lock, 50 mics of fentanyl administered, EMS attempted to assist the patient to the cot, but any movement caused severe pain, the patient was unable to tolerate the pain. Patient leaned back and attempted to relax in the recliner, the patient then had a severe spasm of pain and cried out again, one milligram of Ativan was then administered, attempting to help the patient up, and when the patient is moved an inch, it causes severe deb debilitating pain. After duration, an additional 50 mics of fentanyl is administered, along with 4 milligrams of Zofran. After the duration, after duration, the patient continues to have 10 out of 10 pain and is unbearable pain when he is moved an inch. The patient, 
The patient, when attempting to move, and EMS assisting him says, no, no, I can't do it, and lays back down. Orly showing AFib, SVR, patient has no history of AFib. 12 lead showing AFib, SVR, anterior hemi block with no significant ST elevation nor depression. Here are zero milliseconds for SV, 84 milliseconds, axis deviation of negative 36 degrees, flat in T waves and AVF, and biphasic T waves in V1. Adequate duration for pain medication to begin working had taken place. A decision to administer a Versed for painful procedure in muscle relaxer to cease muscle spasms. Procedure explained to the patient. 2.5 milligrams of Versed administered after approximately one minute. Patient heavily relied upon EMS to move to the patient to the cot. After Versed administration, patient is assisted to stand position. Patient cries out and screams in pain. Patient moved to the cot, assisted by EMS with great difficulty. Patient moved to the cot and is sitting on the cot, and the patient goes unresponsive. Patient moved via upper arms and legs into position on the cot and then repositioned via blanket. Patient is secured on cot and ready for transport. Patient's SpO2 is decreasing and end tidal CO2 nasal cannula applied with 6 liters per minute O2. Initially caused the SpO2 to jump back to 98-99%. Oxygen later decreased to 4 liters per minute and SpO2 remained adequate. Patient is hypotensive and normal sailing bag hung wide open. Lung sounds are clear all fields. Vitals as recorded. Patient is continuously monitored throughout the duration of EMS care. Patient's GCS increases, but patient is still altered and lethargic. In route, a 16 gauge IV established left AC with sailing bag wide open. Patient is continuously monitored. Looking at our vital signs here, we can see that we started off fine, and then there was our unresponsive episode. And even unconscious, both of those MAP pressures are still perfusing MAP pressures. We do have one at 1441, MAP pressure of 64. But other than that, these are all perfusing MAP pressures. Per report given to St. Joe's West Bend ER. Nearing St. Joe's West Bend ER, the patient begins to come back around. The patient's GCS increases, and the patient becomes more alert. The patient said, thank you for taking away the pain. <laughs> Yeah, unresponsiveness does uh, take away the pain, but not, not what we are attempting to do. Patient transported to St. Joe's West Bend ER, where patient care is transferred to staff with a verbal report, EMS paperwork, and Mrs. Living facility paperwork. Patient arrives responsive to verbal stimuli with a GCS of 13, which was improved from the lowest GCS of 10. Patient skin pale, warm, dry, normal, with capillary refill less than 3 seconds, and shallow but normal worker breathing. Lung sounds clear all fields. Patient had a total of 800 milliliters of normal saline infused through the IVs. Patient remains altered. For information, we have a 78. <coughs> Current information, we have a 78-year-old male, medical history, arthritis, constipation, dementia, GERD, hypertension, osteoporosis, CAD, PVD, long-term opioid usage, versus leg syndrome. So key aspect there is his long-term use of opioids to control his back pain. No known drug allergies, medications. We can see that we are on a beta blocker. We can see that we have a benzodiazepine. We can see our fentanyl patch. So those are the medications in medical history that's pertinent to this. So why why did he fall off the cliff? You know, we can look at the long-term long narcotic use. We can look at fentanyl has is protein bound to albumin with 80 to 85 percent. The first fentanyl was given at 1350 hours and that should have almost immediate effect with the duration of 30 to 60 minutes. Four minutes after that, one milligram of Ativan was administered. The onset should be one to three minutes with the duration of six to eight hours. That one milligram, four minutes after the fact, yeah, that's, that is too close. Uh, lorazepam has, is also albumin protein bound and so when we give fentanyl and then we give lorazepam, we are bumping off some of the fentanyl and that is then free and active to go to the receptor sites. It is no longer bound and inert. Six minutes after that Ativan was administered, another 50 mics of fentanyl was given that should have a almost immediate onset with a duration of 30 to 60 minutes. <clears throat> Waiting two minutes after that, four milligrams of Zofran was added, which is also albumin bound, except with 73%. After the 50 mics of fentanyl, then the one milligram of Ativan, then the 50 mics more of fentanyl, then the four milligrams of Zofran, 20 minutes elapsed from that time period and the patient was still having excruciating pain and that is when I chose to give the two and a half milligrams of Versed. I was thinking painful procedure, we're going to make you forget it, it's going to hurt really bad but we'll get you up onto the cot and get you where we need to be so we can get to the hospital. That two and a half milligrams of Versed is the you know, a fine dose, if 
you are starting with no medications on board for a painful procedure, but Versed is albumin bound and has a 97% affinity. So in 33 minutes total, my patient got 100 mics of fentanyl, one milligram of Ativan, two and a half milligrams of Versed, and four milligrams of Zofran. All of them are plasma protein bound to albumin. All of them have a high affinity. And you can easily see why my patient tanked and went unresponsive and needed resuscitation with oxygen and fluids. Yes, his map only dipped once, and that was just one time total at 1441 hours. However, this was still too much and too close. This was before I thought much about protein plasma bound molecules and who bumps who and how I administer multiple medications. You know, the end result of this is we have to be aware and we have to be very careful and cautious. If we are going to start layering medications, we need to be very cautious. We need to leave enough time for those medications to work. I think that the fentanyl was a bad choice here in hindsight. He's on a fentanyl patch. He's been on a fentanyl patch for years. He probably has a significant tolerance to fentanyl and probably to opioids. However, different opioids act on different sites. Fentanyl operates mostly on the mu receptor site, the mu opioid receptor site. And so fentanyl might not have been the best choice knowing that he has a fentanyl patch and knowing that he's been on fentanyl for years. Adding the one milligram of lorazepam, that's fine. Um, but adding the full dose for a painful procedure of two and a half milligrams of Versed, that is where I ran into big trouble. You know, the patient went unresponsive. Um, the fact that it happened one minute after administration of Versed makes me wonder if the patient was already moving that direction, but 20 minutes did elapse from the Zofran to then administering the, the Versed. But starting with two and a half milligrams, not so much. And so just a cautionary tale of when you are adding and layering medications to be mindful of how it will potentiate and think about where it's binding. Think about, okay, I'm already have a fentanyl patch on constantly, I'm already probably bound quite a bit. And so when I go and dump more and more, I need to be thinking about what I'm kicking off and what I'm pushing into off of the protein, off of the albumin, and into free circulation, ready and available. So be careful. Once again, if we look at albumin and alpha-1 acid glycoproteins, if we think about them like a school bus, and you have so many seats at the school bus, the school bus can pick up so many kids, and think about it in terms of transportation. Once the school bus is full, then kids get left there, they run around, they're very active. Looking at a simplistic drawing, here's our blood vessel, bloodstream with the blue receptor sites and our school bus albumin. And if we in start an IV catheter and then administer some fentanyl, the blue being the mu receptor sites. So if we administer one fentanyl that is going to be bound as 80-85% protein plasma bound. So that is going to jump onto that albumin and get stuck there. You're not going to get any pain relief because you weren't able to actually activate a receptor. So if we added three more fentanyl, this is going to go be able to completely fill the albumin, but we're still not providing any pain relief. 
because there's no none there to go on the receptor sites itself. So if we add even more, there's where we finally can actually be able to activate the receptor sites and be able to pro provide pain relief. So we are finally enough medication to get pain relief. But what if <clears throat> we only administer a little bit, let's say that we administered six units altogether. And so we're going to have four that are going to be bound and we are going to have two that are going to be able to go and activate the opioid receptor sites. So those will fill those and provide some relief. Let's say that was our max dose. Six was all our protocol allowed. So we want to bring on, let's say, Versed. Versed also jumps on albumin and has a much higher affinity, 97%. So let's administer some Versed. And what is going to happen there is excessively complex. It's not as simple as this, but basically they're going to bump the albumin and become albumin bound because it has a higher affinity that will cause those to break off and then be free and available while well, free and available not bound activates the receptor sites so we're going to have much more as by the drawing we administered three versed you can see only one is activated but that bumping potentiates it and so you end up with a lot bigger response how and why is very complex. I was not able to find a simple answer. It is very, very complicated and there's not a perfect mathematical equation. I administered 50 mics of fentanyl. I administered two milligrams of Versed. Therefore, this one is the one that is gonna perfectly win. You just have to be very, very mindful when administering polypharmacology when you are stacking medications and specifically when you are stacking on the same plasma proteins. You know, if we were to administer ketamine and administer fentanyl, well, ketamine is a alpha-1 acid glycoprotein bound, whereas fentanyl is albumin, and so it's not going to stack. It is not going to have, you know, they're not going to fight that affinity is not gonna to fight to be bound. And so you're working on different receptor sites. End result, make sure that you are paying very close attention. Make sure that you are lowering the dose, especially for your liver failure patients, your patients with low albumin. You want to be extra cautious in the amount that you administer. And anytime that you are layering medications, you need to take caution. Always strive to better yourself and stay safe, guys.